Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. My name is Georgina Rayner, and I am an associate conservation scientist in the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at the Harvard Art Museums. This virtual conversation is the last in our series of talks exploring our funerary portraits held in conjunction with the special exhibition at the museums, funerary portraits from Egypt facing forward um, on view now and through the end of December. Um, I'll just say a few words about the format of this event uh, before I introduce our uh, guest, Haddon Dine. This conversation is taking place in the Zoom webinar format. Um, Haddon and I will speak for about 20 minutes uh, before turning um, to the audience questions for the remainder of this time. I invite you to pop questions and comments into the Q&A box as they occur to you throughout the conversation, and we'll turn to these at the end. Haddon Dine is an assistant uh, objects conservator at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and before Chicago, she was the objects conservation fellow in the Strauss Center. Haddon shared her expertise uh, as an essay contributor um, to the online digital companion to the exhibition. Um, and we're delighted that she's here to join us today. So today my uh, conversation with Haddon uh, will focus on the three-dimensional portraits, um, which is one of the three kinds of portraits that we have in our show. Um, they're displayed alongside the uh, painted wooden panels and of course the uh, funerary shroud that was the focus of the last concert, uh, con conversation um, between Caitlin and Lizette. And for those of you who have not had the chance to see the show in person, uh, we have four three-dimensional portraits on display. Um, we have the one from the Harvard collection, and then we borrowed one from the Rhode Island School of Design and two from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, these portraits are often referred to as masks. Um, they were made uh, during the same time period as the portraits uh, painted on wood um, during the Roman Empire in Egypt. And similarly uh, to the panel portraits, um, these three-dimensional portraits, we, uh, we're seeing the Roman influences in the representation of the person depicted um, being combined with the more traditional uh, Egyptian funerary practices. Okay, so to kick us off, Haddon, um, at the museum, we've been studying our painted panel portraits for some years. Um, we've been trying to understand how they were made and the materials used. Um, and with the development of the exhibition, it really became the right time for us to study our three-dimensional portrait. Um, so I'd love to invite you to tell us a bit more about the portrait in the Harvard collection and why the study is important. Thank you, Georgina. So while there is a large body of literature on ancient Egyptian polychromy and Egyptian portraits on wood, there is relatively limited technical research on this particular kind of funerary portrait. Um, this object was made in Egypt during the period of the Roman Empire, as Georgina said. It's a plaster head of a man, and it has significant remnants of paint on it. And while this is a fragment, the head itself is intact and in stable condition. So you can see the man has facial hair, he's wearing a cloak and tunic, and there's translucent glass over his eye, or for his eyes. And the face portion of this, at least, would have been cast in a mold, with details such as the hair and ears added. The face would have been further shaped to individualize the portrait. The hair and beard are dark brown, and there's a red brown used for the edge of the cloak and on the back of the neck. This would have originally extended farther, likely including hands crossed over the chest, as shown in the drawing on the left, and been placed over the head area of a mummy. On the right here is a more intact example from the Louvre. And this type of portrait is just one of several categories or kinds of portraits that were being produced during this time period at different workshops. So to show you some things that you would notice if you were looking at this object very closely in person, there are two colors of pink on the face. There's a darker pink over a lighter pink. The eyes are covered with translucent glass plates. There are painted eyelashes and eyebrows, and there are remnants of dark red in the nostrils and between the lips. 
And one of the first things that examination has resolved is that we are now fairly certain what this image on the back of the neck was. So on the left is the back of the neck of this um, portrait at Harvard. And the backs of the necks of these portraits often have scenes of Egyptian iconography, sometimes gods, and often a mummy. And looking closely, the remnants do seem to be consistent with the head and feet of a mummy. On the right is the back of the portrait from Rhode Island School of Design which is on view now with the Harvard example. And it seems very plausible that the same imagery was on the Harvard portrait. Well, thanks, Hadden. Um, it's really interesting to think about how this portrait might have looked in comparison to what it looks like now. Um, much like our study of the painted panel portraits, um, this technical study set out to identify the materials used for the three-dimensional portrait and hopefully to gain a better understanding of how the portrait was made. Um, was there anything else you hope to explore as well? Yes, so in addition to the materials and what it originally looked like, we were trying to explore construction and Asia Mueller is a researcher in Germany whose thesis focuses on these Egyptian Roman funerary portraits, these three-dimensional plaster ones. And she has attributed many of these portraits to different workshop groups. And these workshop groups are named for the tombs where the portraits are found. She's written about the characteristics that can be used to assign workshop groups to unprovenance portraits. And so this Harvard portrait was likely produced in Middle Egypt and it's been attributed to one of two groups produced by workshop that made the pieces found at Tuna El Kibbel in Antonopolis. And based on the hairstyle, she dates it to the second half of the second century AD. So anything we were able to find out about the construction methods of this would really inform workshop practices now that we're able to attribute these portraits to different groupings. That's really interesting because we've been thinking a lot about the idea of workshop practice for the other funerary portraits as well. Um, so I think we're uh, ready to delve into the technical examination side of things. Um, myself and the other curators of the show have really enjoyed being able to show examples of technical imaging in the gallery um, because it's really helpful to look at these portraits with different illuminations. Um, so I think here um, it would be nice to show an example of technical imaging um, uh, to show what you found when studying this portrait. Absolutely. We have some images ultraviolet fluorescence. So here we're illuminating the portrait with UV light and then we're seeing visible fluorescence. And this allows us to see the white painting on the cloak, which isn't so distinguishable in normal light, as well as areas that fluoresce in orange pink, which is characteristic for Matter Lake. And you can see more of that on this side of the cloak. So we're currently identifying this pigment just based on this characteristic UV fluorescence. We don't know 100% for sure that it's matter lake, but we're fairly sure. And if you look closely, you can see remnants of lines here in these areas. And here's a comparison just to show you how little you can see that pink pigment in normal light. There's really just a hint of pink. It's barely noticeable, but when you look at it in UV light, you can really see the remnants of those designs. That's great. These images are such a wonderful example of why technical imaging is such an important part of a conservator's toolkit. Um, I, I think it would be really easy just to just not notice that matter pigment um, being there, um, or at the very least not understand how widely it was applied across the cloak. Um, it's also interesting that it doesn't appear to have been used in the face, which we've seen in some of the other uh, painted panel uh, portraits. Um, so I wonder if we might switch now to look at how the portrait was constructed. Um, you mentioned that it was one of the major questions. So how much could you learn about the construction from just close looking? So we were able to learn some through close looking and then we ended up doing other techniques. So according to the literature, the face was made separately in a mold and methods for making the rest of the head differed, possibly based on workshop. Methods for inserting the eyes differed and the chest and neck areas were often constructed from panels for certain types of these portraits. So, and investigating how this was constructed, now that we have provenance from Ozzy's research would allow us to compare our findings with portraits from the same workshop grouping. So first, just looking visually, um, you can see this stratigraphy of the underside panel and the chest panel. You can see some differences in color here. And both are both of these 
these plasters are coarse and have what looks like sand mixed in. And this is the lower back edge of the neck. And you can see even more layering here. So at least four layers visible. So the one on the far left is again the underside panel, and then the one on the right is the back of the neck, but there are some other applications of plaster in there. And here we can see what might be joins. This is the ear area. And the face portion that was made in a mold, may, maybe it ends here at the front of the ear. Um, this could also be the edge, and the ears are described as being made separately. And at the bottom, we're seeing the join of the cloak panel to the head where a gap didn't quite get filled in like it did along the rest of the seam. So these details give us insight into some of the construction methods. So this is that area there. And another detail is that there are actually finger smears on the forehead and finger marks on the chest in the plaster. And some references talk about these portraits being covered with a final skim coating of fine plaster. And we did later find some evidence that fine plaster does seem to have been added in areas. So that tells us a little bit more as well. So that's just looking without, without applying any other techniques yet. And that's a lot of information, I think, just to get from the looking. Um, if the head was pressed into, the, into a mold, um, would we expect the inside of the head to be hollow? Um, I know that the portrait is sealed at the bottom, so it's not possible to see inside the head. Um, were you able to look at it with X-radiography? We were. So we did do X-radiography because you're right, this portrait is closed on the bottom. We can't see inside. Um, on the right is an X-radiograph. So just like an X-ray of a body part, the white parts are where there's more material for the X-rays to pass through. And you can see that the head is hollow. So we're seeing sort of the walls of the head and at first glance, um, the walls and the panels, everything seems pretty even. Um, you can see the panels of plaster used for the neck and the chest. But as you spend more time looking at it, you start to notice some irregularities. So the texture of the hair complicates things here, but you can see what look like lines. Um, some of them are outlined in green here, maybe seams, thicker areas of overlap. We weren't sure what these were. And you can see some more irregularities, thin points in the walls of the head. And these look like maybe possible joins. There's some slight directional changes. And there also appears to be a smear of plaster on the inside of the face that looks like it maybe has finger marks in it. So that's sort of outlined here. And we hope to figure out more about this with CT scanning. So Greg Lynn at the Center for Nanoscale Systems performed micro CT scanning on the object. We were able to leave the portrait packed in its box and put the entire box into the instrument. So this is the instrument shown here. And Greg then made a 3D model from the CT data that lets us see inside the portrait. So this is a screenshot from an animation that he made. And we can see so much more here than we could with just the X radiographs. And we we're really interested to see these regular ridges here, which look to be pressed into place in a practiced way. It looks like they're finger marks. And so these are the irregularities that we were seeing in the walls in the x-rays earlier. And the view of the model behind the eyes shows us clumps of plaster pressed into place with what look like large and small finger or tool marks. And so this is what we were seeing before when we were seeing this sort of blob behind the eyes. This is the inside surface of that plaster. And Greg also gave us thousands of images that are slice views of the portrait. So now we're, this is a view through the head horizontally below the eyes. You can see the nose at the top of the image. And you can see an added layer of finer plaster on the nose here. And we think this finer plaster was maybe applied after the face was taken out of the mold to further shape and individualize the features as it's described in the literature. But it's also possible that this was maybe applied inside the mold before the coarser plaster was pressed in. So it seems that these workshops would have been reusing molds for multiple people's masks and in, uh, portraits and individualizing these um, after they came out of the molds. That's one possibility of what, the, explaining this finer plaster. And there seem to be possible joints at the ear areas here. And these are what we were looking at visually earlier from the outside. And this is where those pressed panels of plaster converge or come together. 
And this seems to be where they're meeting with the edge of the face portion. Um, so the, the face portion that was made in a mold seems to end in this ear area. And then the rest of the back of the head was built up with these pressed panels of plaster. So here's a closer look at that ear area. And then this is a slice view farther up through the head, closer to the eyes. And you can see the bottom of the plaster that is behind the eyes that has finger marks in it. And here we've moved up yet again, and we're now seeing the glass plates of the eyes, which are surprisingly thin. And here's a closer look at that. There is material on the glass behind it. And then there are some voids behind that material, which indicates to us that the glass is reverse painted rather than being placed over painted plaster. There is paint on actually on the back of the glass that is making up the eyes. So now we switch to YZ slice view or vertical view sort of right through the nose. And here you can more clearly see that layer of finer plaster on both the nose and also on the chin. And you can see the texture of the applied hair. And now moving across into an eye again. So there seem to be possible seams where material was added behind the eyes, which suggests it's the only material behind the eyes, meaning there would have been a hole in the head and then the eyes were inserted either from the outside or the inside, probably from behind, but we're not completely sure. And then plaster was pressed into place behind those glass plates. You can see the void behind the glass again and the plaster behind the glass has a curve to it. And the ridge closest to the eyes is probably the edge of that cast face portion. So we talked about the ears being sort of the sides of that cast portion, and this ridge is probably where it ends at the top. Oh, sorry. Well, that's great. It's not often we get to utilize something like a CT scanner for our research. Um, but being able to do that three-dimensional imaging for this portrait really makes it clear the various stages used in the construction and you know perhaps it's giving us a sense of the artist's hand as well um so before we open it up to questions from the audience uh my final question to you Hatton um were you able to locate other examples that are similar and could be from the same workshop yes so there are many other portraits that are likely from the same workshop grouping, including um, the Rhode Island one on view with the Harvard maps right now. Um, and there are also other published studies of portraits, often fragmentary portraits that were not previously grouped by workshop in the way that Ozzy's research has allowed us to do now. So we can really begin to compare the information that we have about this portrait to research that's been published on other portraits and also seeking out other portraits that we know are from the same workshop grouping. And one really clear similarity is actually the blobs of plaster that we're seeing behind the eyes look a lot like the plaster behind the eyes of this portrait, which is at the Kunsthistorisch Museum in Vienna. And so this is from a publication where they have photos of different masks in their collection. And this seems to be from the same workshop grouping. And the inside of the rest of the head of that same portrait looks like it may have similar panel structure to what we are seeing on the CT scanning. And so the hope is to continue making comparisons to other portraits that are presumably from the same workshop group as the Harvard portrait, again, such as this RISD portrait, and we can see how construction differs. And it would also be interesting to compare to portraits that may be from the same mold. So we've talked about these molds being used and no molds have been found, but you can sometimes see really distinct similarities between the faces of some of these portraits. And Ozzie Mueller has suggested that this portrait on the right, which is at the Louvre, may be from the same mold as the Harvard object. So the face may have come out of the same mold. And here are a couple other portraits that I think look similar to that portrait and the Harvard portrait. And everything that we're finding out is contributing to what is known about these portraits. And Egyptian funerary portraits in general. Well, thank you. So this uh, three-dimensional portrait that Haddon uh, studied is on view in the exhibition. Um, and accompanying that, we have a digital screen um, showing some of the images you've seen here today, um, looking at the analysis. Um, 
and of course Haddon wrote for their digital tour. Um, so here's a chance for us to take some questions. We do have one initial question, Haddon. Um, Sandra Stern is asking if the ears on the x-ray looked as though they were moved, um, but I'm wondering if that's because that's where a lot of the seam and joins are happening. That's a good question. Yes, I don't remember seeing anything that indicated that they were moved. I think that it's a lot of the joining and the, the plaster that's pressed in the back of the head sort of coming together at that point, but would be something to think about. I'll... There's no evidence of repair there though. So I think probably once that was put on as wet plaster, it would have been difficult to, to move them after that fact without there being some sort of evidence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good question. Um, that's the only question we have from the audience right now. Well, I will ask Georgina a question. And so okay. all, so far we've only shown today um, non-invasive methods of looking at this object, but the study did also involve some invasive methods where, that require taking a small bit of material. And this was done with a lot of thought, but I was wondering, Georgina, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the other analysis techniques that we used in this study. Sure, of course, I'd be happy to. So um, one of the things we did was to look at the plaster to understand what that was. Um, and so what we did is we took a tiny little sample and um, what we did with our analysis is that we found that it contained gypsum. And what was interesting in that looking at the particles of gypsum within the sample, which you can see in the black and white image, um, we saw that we have um, sort of needle shaped uh, particles. And that tells us that the, the gypsum plaster was used. Um, that means it was molded uh, when the plaster material was damp or wet, and then the gypsum, it crystallizes into needles as it dries into this nice hard uh, material. Um, and then the other uh, bit analysis that we were doing was to really understand the application of paint onto the, the front of the mask. So we uh, took a little sample from the red cloak and we prepared that as a cross section. And then that allows us to look at the layers of paint retouching. Um, and we do that by mounting our little samples into blocks of resin and then slicing through it. Uh, it's sort of like slicing through a cake and revealing the layers. Um, so the top bright red layer is the surface layer that we see. Um, and it was uh, very iron rich. So we are consistent with the use of a red ochre pigment. And then the lower, uh, surface layer um, is a sort of a more of a light pink paint um, applied to the neck and the chest area and clearly applied before the cloak. And it contains a mixture of uh, two white pigments called calcite and huntite. And there's a small amount of red ochre, but what's interesting is when you look at the UV, you can actually see that within this lighter pink paint, there's actually two layers that are present and um, it's the same materials, the same huntite, calcite, and iron, but they're just in slightly different ratios. Um, so we're able to suggest that there's three paint layers that are applied to the portrait. Um, so that was a really interesting sort of snapshot of some of the analysis that we could do. Um, a question from the audience, Haddon, is there any signs of retouching um, restoration work to the portrait? We actually, there's a material on the underside, there's a sort of whitish material that we think is probably more recent. Um, not sure, we didn't show any quite photos of the underside, but actually can I flip through to this. So that is probably the only material that we think was added later. Um, we didn't see any signs of any of the other paint being later restoration or anything like that or um, differences. So that's one thing that, that often stands out when we look at something in UV or, or different, illuminated in different lights, um, but no, actually. Um, and another question, um, did you identify any Egyptian blue? We did not find any Egyptian mm -hmm. blue. We did look for Egyptian blue. So we used the um, imaging technique that where Egyptian blue will actually, it, there's a technique can be used to look for Egyptian blue, but no, we did not find that. 
Um, we do have a question asking us a little more about the markings on the back of the RISD portrait um, and why do you think they're there? Um, do you want to comment on that or would you like me to do it? You are welcome to answer that. I know there are often different, um, there's iconography on these and it differs a lot in different scenes of gods, but yeah, if you know more about that, Georgina, please go I mean, for it. I, I know I'm no um, Egyptologist, but um, in talking to Jan, who was one of the creators of the show, we've talked about it. So um, we've moved on to a time when all of the funerary rituals is on the body as opposed to being included with burial goods. And so that you, having the iconography on the back, so it's a, it's a mummy on a beer and um, I forget who is flanked on either side, but it's it's a way of having the imagery that's important in the funerary practice with the body. And so it was put on the back of the neck. Um, that's my best um, way of, oh, Jen's chimed in. It's um, Isis and Nephthys, um, all mourners identified with them. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, all right, another question. Um, is about the reverse painted glass techniques um, that may have been used on the eyes. And then the question is, has this been compared um, perhaps to glass, uh, painted glass portraits or other uses of this method in late antique Egypt? I am not sure about that. So I didn't, haven't done those comparisons. I was mostly focusing on how these portraits were constructed and reading about what people have documented as different construction methods for these different kinds of plaster portraits. And sometimes the glass is reverse painted. Sometimes it seems to not have been reverse painted. There are also opaque glass eyes. There were eyes that sometimes had metal or stone. There were a, a large um, variety of ways of putting these, uh, making these eyes. But um, no, I that's interesting. And I haven't read more about comparing it to sort of reverse painting on glass outside of this context. Okay, and then the final question we have right now is, um, and I am probably not remembering this, but was there a difference between the finer plaster that was applied as the top coat? Um, I think I remember it still being the gypsum plaster. It was just finer and it didn't have as many inclusions in it. I believe that's right. Everything was gypsum plaster. Um, I know the inclusions varied a little bit, color varied a little bit but I think those were the differences. So there do, do seem to be different coarsenesses of plaster that were used intentionally. Um, different things were mixed in and they were used for different parts of the construction. But it's all gypsum plaster. Well, we have a couple of minutes left. So if anyone else has any questions, um, please let us know. Um, so Hadden, what, just as we have a few minutes left, is there anything unexpected that you discovered while you were studying uh, this portrait? Yes, I will go. Sorry, I hope I don't make everyone sick flying through <laughs> these, but I have to go back to the end. There, one fun thing that we found was these, which look like some kind of pest casing. And so in conservation, we're often worried about pest casings, but these don't look like any sort of museum pests that I'm familiar with. Um, they're, so these are in the hair and they seem to be made up of a brown inner layer, which you can see in the broken one on the far right, and covered in a gray layer, which you can see on the other one. So we didn't know what these were. So we contacted Richard Pollock, who's an entomologist who works as the Senior Environmental Public Health Officer for Harvard Environmental Health and Safety. And he happened to be in the building, actually, and came and looked at these and identified them as being from a mud dauber wasp. And so a mud dob or wasp gathers mud to build a cell and then it stings and paralyzes a spider or insect and puts it inside with an egg and closes it up. So when the egg hatches, it has a food source. And after that eats and grows, it forms a cocoon. So the brown material we're seeing is the cocoon and the gray material is the outer mud shell. And there are many types of this kind of wasp all over the world and they build nests in a variety of shapes. So it is possible that these wasps built their cocoons on this at some point over the last 2000 years, but it seems like maybe there's also a sliver of possibility that this, a sliver of possibility that these could be ancient remnants. So that was, that was kind of fun. Yeah, that's very unexpected. 
All right. Well, I, I think we're at time. Well, so so thank you for that great conversation, Haddon. And um, thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, my co-curators and I hope that you've enjoyed this small series of conversations. And Funerary Portraits from Roman Egypt Facing Forward is on view now through the end of December. And if you cannot make it to Cambridge, we do have a digital tour available on our website um, that accompanies the exhibition, which you can explore. Um, thank you, everyone.